The Panzerkampfwagen 6 Tiger, or Tiger 1, is one of, if not arguably, the most iconic tank of World War II. Ever since it was first deployed 81 years ago in 1942, it has been the stuff of legends. Some say that during the war, it was a tank which induced sufficient fear that the mere rumor of one's presence could halt localized advances and change the course of battle. And since the war's conclusion, well, that legend has only grown. And yet, despite its undeniably legendary status, the Tiger I is an unbelievably contentious tank, one that divides historians. This debate is an interesting one, but today we're actually going to be presenting and evaluating a bit of a different hypothesis, one in which we reject this dichotomy altogether and instead present a new claimant for the most illustrious legends that the Tiger I possesses. But what other tank could claim such a mantle? Well, this is the object of our awe today, the French Char B1. You may think that we've got a bit mad here, as this tank is decried by many as a sloth of a thing that was far too slow, equipped with a ridiculously short barrel and all but impossible to traverse short barrel howitzer. A tank often dubbed the greatest First World War tank to reflect just how obsolete it had become by the Second World War. But today we're actually going to be presenting a counter to these negative claims, because what if the supposedly laughable and horrific Shah B-1 was actually the real Tiger I? A tank which filled its opponents with dread, which could shake off cannon fire and keep on going, and whose sheer power could alter the flow of a battle entirely on its own. Before we can assess whether or not the Shah B-1 was the real Tiger, it's vital that we understand its history. And like the Tiger, the development of the Shah B-1 was far from smooth. Design work began in 1921, and as with all interwar French military projects, the Shah B-1's development was at the mercy of unstable governments and their ever-changing whims. On top of this, the Shah B-1 also had to be designed around a French military elite that could not decide where they wanted to spend their money. One year, the Renault officers were overflowing with cash, while the next year, funding could all but disappear as the French military decided that actually no, a new breakthrough tank could wait, and what they really needed right now was a new light machine gun, or a battleship, or just more money for the Maginot Line. Renault persisted, however, despite this difficult design environment, and eventually the design work on the Char B-1 was finally finished in 1934, after 13 very long years. Production of the neglected Shah B-1 then finally began in 1935 and would continue up until 1940, when France's defeat at the hands of Germany rather destroyed the French government's need for, well, new tanks. In this period, two main variants of the Shah B-1 were produced, the original Shah B-1 and the improved Shah B-1 bis. So at this point, let's take some time to talk about the Shah B-1's unorthodox and rather bizarre looks. I mean, if you ask a child to draw what a tank looks like, what they draw is not going to resemble the Shah B-1. With a girthy yet stubby SA 3575mm howitzer mounted on a fixed forward-facing casemate, a long frame accommodating a sizable 16.5-litre six-cylinder Renault petrol engine, and a tiny little one-man turret on top housing a more modest 47mm cannon, the Shah B-1's appearance certainly defies convention, even by the often bizarre standards of interwar tank design. The unorthodox appearance was the result of the Shah B-1's unique development, which rather than looking ahead to the future to create the ultimate tank for the next conflict, harkens back to the Great War to create a tank that would have been perfect for the past. Envisioned as a self-propelled gun rather than an actual tank, French authorities initially requested a heavy armored vehicle which could easily cross trenches, hence its long length, and easily bring heavy weaponry to bear against enemy fortifications, hence its 75mm howitzer mounted low in the hull so it could be pointed into the vision slits of enemy fortifications. Midway through the Shah B-1's development, however, it was reasoned that this self-propelled gun configuration might leave the Shah B-1 vulnerable to flanking attacks, so a solution was sought to give it a bit more of a defensive punch. What was that solution? Well, a little one-man turret plonked on top, equipped with a 47mm gun. 
It can be easy to forget when it is otherwise dwarfed by the 75mm monster in the hull, but by interwar and early World War II standards, a 47mm tank cannon was quite the sizable thing in its own right. For example, the British Mark II Crusader only carried a 40mm cannon, and the most common German tank of the Battle of France, the Panzer II, only sported a 20mm autocannon. Although certainly not up to snuff when late war heavy tanks began making their appearance, for its time, a 47mm gun was actually perfectly adequate. And not only were the B-1's guns big, but in fact, the whole tank was big, whopping 21 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 9 feet tall, and it all weighed 31 tons. A lot of this weight came from the tank's armor, which was very thick due to its planned deployment against fortified positions, 60mm on the original Shah B-1 and 75mm on the improved Shah B-1 Bis. For context, the main anti-tank gun employed by the Germans during the Battle of France, the Pac-36, when firing the best quality tungsten core round available, was only capable of penetrating a maximum 64mm of armor. In light of this, it isn't surprising that the Shah B-1 was considered one of the most powerful tanks of its time. There's no doubt that it represented a fearsome prospect on the battlefield, but if we wish to come to an informed conclusion regarding how tiger-like the Shah B-1 is, uh, we shouldn't artificially venerate its merits. Every tank, no matter how groundbreaking, has its drawbacks. It is simply the reality of engineering, and the Shah B-1 is no exception. To come to an informed conclusion, we now need to look at three shortcomings. For starters, the Shah B-1 may have had a fearsome main armament with its 75mm or SA-35 howitzer, but it was implemented in an ineffective way. The major drawback was that it only had one degree of traverse in either direction, and even this was only intended for zeroing the cannon and not for use in combat. Consequently, the cannon could only be traversed by turning the whole tank. Now, this isn't quite the disaster that it may first sound like, because a Renault did engineer some clever solutions into the Shah B-1 to minimize the issues caused by this. The first such solution was to combine the roles of the driver and the gunner in the tank so that the same crew member had direct control of both the firing of the gun and the traversing of the tank, theoretically eliminating any efficiency that would be generated by these normally two separate roles having to communicate with each other during battle. To further reduce complications from this, the Shah B-1's traverse was also improved through the use of a NADA steering system, a sophisticated hydraulic system which assisted the tank in traversing, allowing the Shah B-1 to make the sort of fast and precise pivots that many other tanks simply were not capable of. These certainly served to minimize the negative effects of the design dead end that Renault had engineered themselves into. But a minimization is certainly not an elimination, and the Shah B-1's driver gunners uh, were seriously overworked. Another major drawback of the Shah B-1 was one that it shared with all French tanks, its one main turret. The logic goes that regardless of how big it may or may not be, a tank turret has to perform the same basic functions – shooting and spotting. In typical tank design, this sees the turret made large enough to accommodate three crew members – a commander, a gunner, and a loader. A one-man turret, on the other hand, sees all of these duties performed by one crew member. If Renault had incorporated some clever workaround to minimize the impact of this design choice, as they had with the Shah B-1's traversing system, uh, we could at least say it was a minimized detriment, but alas. They didn't do that. There was no clever workaround, and there are no qualifiers to present. It was simply a bad design choice that led to the tanks performing poorly compared to their three-man turreted counterparts. And with that, our overview of the Shah B-1's development, history, and technical specifications is complete, and we are one step closer to answering the question that we posed at the start of the video. So now let's delve into the challenge for the title, The Tiger One. Before we get into this, we must stop and ask ourselves, which tiger are we comparing the Shah B-1 to? And by this I don't mean which mark of the tiger, or even which specific tiger uh, we're comparing it to, but as the tiger one is such a contentious tank, we must first decide how we view it ourselves. And please do note we have no interest in spoon-feeding you one particular position. This video is intended to encourage you to come to your own conclusions, not force ours upon you. So with that in mind, we'll cover both positions, and then you can choose which one sounds right to you. 
Tiger One detractors, or the Tiger haters as we'll now call them, argue that tales of the Tiger One's awesome exploits are grossly exaggerated and that these isolated exceptional events are not representative of the typical Tiger. This is best demonstrated by Michael Whitman, arguably the most famous tank commander of World War II, who supposedly destroyed the entire British 4th County London Yeomanry Regiment on the 13th of June 1944 while in command of a Tiger One in a daring act which many claim is grossly exaggerated. Firstly, there is the question of how one accurately counts kills, because since combat tends to be quite the chaotic affair, self-attributed kill counts are often heavily contested. Is that tank smoking, or is it actually knocked out, etc., etc.? This, of course, assumes that tank commanders generally, and Michael Whitman specifically, were being honest in the first place. Because when German kills were self-reported, what glory-hungry commander wouldn't be tempted to fudge the numbers a bit? Michael Whitman's attack on the 13th of June was certainly an impressive feat, make no mistake. But did he really knock out 13 tanks and 15 other vehicles, and all by himself at that. To deconstruct Michael Whitman's legend further still, many will point to what made it spread. The Nazi propaganda machine. You see, Whitman himself didn't survive the war, and his famous figures actually come from Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, who leapt on Michael Whitman's success as a golden opportunity to convince the German public that actually, contrary to the horror stories that they had heard from returning soldiers and what the state of their bombed-out house would lead them to believe, the war was actually going marvelously. No need to stress, please keep turning up to work and feeding your sons into the meat grinder. Now, we're not scholars of Nazism, but we feel confident enough to say that the Nazi propaganda Gander machine might have actually been a bit dishonest from time to time, an earth-shattering revelation, we're sure. Therefore, if you are to assume that Michael Whitman's exploits are exaggerated, be it from him or his superiors, is the tiger in fact legendary? Those who do believe in the Tiger One legends, the Tiger Enjoyers, build their arguments around the hard factors of the tank, its big gun, its thick armor, and its surprisingly agile top speed. This view, which also makes it much easier to compare tanks to one another, forms a solid foundation of a belief in the Tiger as a most excellent tank, because it has big numbers. This foundation is then built upon by individual tales of excellence, such as the aforementioned Michael Whitman legend, legends which they typically believe to be by and large correct. To be fair to the Tiger enjoyers, it is certainly easy to argue that many critics of the tiger can go too far in their critiques to the point of completely dismissing the importance of armor that could take a beating and a big gun that could deal big damage but equally one can certainly see the argument that focusing too much on these ultimately rather arbitrary statistics naturally lends one to a more simplistic understanding of the vehicle as such base measurements simply don't lend themselves to understanding the nuance of the true situation so, now that we have a thorough understanding of the Tiger's legend, let's now focus back in on the Shah B1 and see if it has what it takes to match this legend. The high point of the Shah B1 service came on the 16th of May 1940. It was the opening stage of the Battle of France, which had only just begun a few days earlier. The French army had yet to collapse, morale was at an all-time high, and as far as anyone was concerned, victory in the Battle of France was still well within the Allies' grasp. The as-of-yet undecided nature of the battle was no better summarized than in the ongoing situation in Ston, a French village that sat 10 miles from the Belgian border. The village had changed hands multiple times the day prior and was still anyone's for the taking. 90,000 German soldiers supported by 300 tanks and three squadrons of Ju-87 dive bombers were determined to hold on to the village and push their advance further, and 42,500 French soldiers and their 130 supporting tanks opposed them. Despite being outnumbered and pushed out of the village, the French clung on, determined to retake what was theirs. The French began the day with a counterattack, which began shortly after 5 p.m. Every man and machine available diligently did their part to retake Ston and then, God willing, push the Germans back to the border. In opposition was the 8th Panzer Regiment, which had brought their best hardware to the fore to resist the French effort. Panzer III's, the primary anti-armor tank, and Panzer IV's, the primary infantry support tank of the German army. The men of the 8th Panzer Regiment were no doubt feeling confident. They were dug in, their hulls were down, and they knew exactly where their enemy would be coming from. The winds of fortune appeared to be blowing in their favor. That confidence, though, 
quickly disappeared thanks to the efforts of a single French tank, a Char B1 of the 41st Tank Battalion. In a masterfully executed move by the tank's commander, Captain Pierre Belote, he ordered his hulking 31.5-ton beast to hold position 100 or so feet away from the German column. Then, without hesitation, the driver, Sergeant Darbt, fired the 75mm howitzer at the rearmost tank of the German column, and Captain Pierre Belote unleashed the 47mm turret gun on the lead tank. At such a short range, the German tanks never stood a chance. The rearmost tank immediately exploded into an enormous fireball as its ammunition racks detonated, knocking its supporting infantry off their feet and immediately killing Ucre on board. The leading tank, meanwhile, suffered a critical hit to its engine block, immediately knocking it out and causing its few surviving crew to abandon it. This masterful move had completely boxed the German column in, leaving them nowhere to run. They did the only thing they could in response, try to turn their front armor to the attacking Char B1 and empty everything they had into it. 37mm rounds from the Panzer III's and 75mm rounds from the Panzer IV's began to rain down on the Char B1's hull in a torrential downpour of tungsten-coated steel. But it was all to no avail, with the 37mm rounds lacking the mass and the 75mm rounds lacking the velocity to penetrate the Char B1's thick armored hull. And nothing happened. Over 140 rounds hit the B1, without a single penetrating hit being scored. The crew of the Shah naturally responded in kind, and one by one picked off the entire column. And by the time the last German cannon fell silent, 11 Panzer III's and 2 Panzer IVs had been destroyed. This was not enough for the crew of the Shah, however. Uh, they further pushed their advance and added two Pac-36 anti-tank guns and their crews to their kill tally. This action caused a complete tactical level collapse of the local German forces, and by 7 a.m., only two hours into the counterattack, Ston always returned to French control. What is even more impressive is that this wasn't even the only example of outlandish success won by the Shah B1 in Ston on that day. Later in the day, at around 5 p.m., the German 64th Rifle Regiment was attempting to push the recently reinstalled French defenders out of the village once again. Their effort proved surprisingly easy and was largely unopposed until they were 800 meters or so from the perimeter of the village, at which point they were intercepted by another Shah B1 named Richwer. This one was from the 49th Tank Battalion. The Germans lacked any heavy ordnance, but nonetheless did all they could do to repel the oncoming tank, peppering the Rikva with mass volleys from their Carabiner 98 Kurs rifles and attempting to immobilize it with precise fire from their Panzerbusch 39 anti tank rifles. This achieved little except attracting the ire of the tank's commander, Lieutenant Domek, who ordered the Rikva to advance on the Germans and performed a 360 degree to reverse, crushing the attackers under the tracks of the tank. The subsequent sight of the Rikvir's gore covered tracks caused mass panic among the remaining German attackers, who all immediately are outed from the scene in terror, leaving Ston in French hands, at least for now. The second incident was certainly less tactically impressive than the Urs exploits, and in all frankness, dramatic though it may have been, opponents with nothing meaner than 7.92 by 94mm Panzerbusch to bring to bear were never going to pose a risk to any Char B1. But this that is little to us today. We're discussing the legends of the tank, and mythical stories such as this are key to understanding that very legend. But these stories raise some questions. If the Shah B1 was so great, and potentially the real tiger, why are incidents like this exceptions to the norm and, well, not the norm itself? If the Shah B1 was capable of such outstanding victories, and the French army had 369 of them in inventory, in addition to significantly outnumbering the Germans in overall number of tanks, why was the Battle of France such a disastrous loss? for the Allies. Why didn't the Shabby ones drive the Germans back through the Ardennes and indeed back to Berlin itself? Well, in a word, tactics. The French army did indeed have more tanks, and on paper higher quality tanks than the German army, but they had absolutely no refined modern doctrine of combined arms warfare, different military branches all working together in an integrated and efficient hierarchy, and therefore able to act as a sum greater than the total of their parts. This inability to carry out coordinated actions was the real reason that the Shah B1, and indeed French tanks more generally, completely failed during the Battle of France. Notice how, in the two accounts previously discussed, we made no reference to supporting infantry or aerial support of the tanks. That was not an omission on the part of this video. Both tanks were operating essentially on their own, with 
little communication beyond their own squadron. This left the heroic actions of people such as Captain Bellati and uh, Lieutenant de Mer and their consequences as amazing openings that were completely unable to be exploited on any bigger strategic level. The problem didn't just rest in doctrine itself, however. Even if the revolutionary will existed within the French military hierarchy to pursue new tactical ideas, the French army's equipment simply was not up to the task. Few French tanks had radios, with the Shah B-1 coincidentally being one of the few tanks that could be relied upon to have a set. The few radios that were in circulation were of dubious quality. They frequently failed even before they were exposed to the rigors of combat. This left French tank commanders in a position where they were barely able to coordinate themselves even on a tactical level, much less so on a strategic level where they needed to communicate effectively with units of infantry and aerial units. It just wasn't happening. Compare this to German tanks, nearly all of which had modern and reliable radios and consequently were able to achieve a level of cross-service coordination that the French could only have dreamt of. When problems arose or resistance was encountered, German tank commanders were able to reliably relay the situation to their senior officers and receive revised orders relevant to the developing flow of battle. The occasional time a radio did fail, German tank commanders had the well-established principle of Aufträgstatik, mission-type tactics, which kept disruption to a minimum. But does this flawed reality actually matter to our question today? A flawed reality has done little to dampen the legend of the tiger, so should we view the Char B-1 through the same lens? With such parallels, maybe it is another tiger rather than the real tiger. Historians may help us to come to a bit of an answer here. They certainly have a wide range of opinions, and both hate and love the tiger just as much as any enthusiast. On the former side, we have historians such as Michael Green, who firmly believes that the Tiger I was the greatest tank of the war, an all but flawless design which wreaked havoc on the battlefield, sowed fear into the enemy, and was a sound investment on the part of the Nazi regime. Indeed, Green dubbed the Tiger the most potent armored weapon of the Second World War. On the latter side, we have historians such as Christopher Lawrence, who stated that many had, quote, already made absurd statements that grossly overrated the Tiger's contribution to battles. But then we also have another position, those who reject the such explicit frameworks altogether, a position held by historians such as Anthony Tucker Jones, who in his book Tiger One and Tiger Two attempts to rationalize the tank, frankly discussing what it did right, what it did wrong, and to put both in their appropriate context. And with that, we finally have all the information we need to answer today's original hypothesis. So now all that's left to do is to decide. While the author of the, the video today veers towards Anthony Tucker Jones's position, and he believes that on one hand, the Tiger One probably doesn't deserve all the love it gets, but equally it doesn't deserve all the hate it gets either. Sure, on one hand, the exploits of Michael Whitman were grossly exaggerated for propaganda purposes before entering common legend, resulting in the Tiger One having a rather unjustified position in popular imagination. But on the flip side, sure, German kill loss ratios have been chronically misunderstood by historians, but this does not necessarily mean that the Tiger One was an abomination of a tank and it is probably reasonable enough to say that it was fine not great not terrible just fine and it performed the role it was intended to fill perfectly adequately but equally so did the shah b1 it too was a flawed tank whose capabilities have been grossly exaggerated by a few choice stories but it was fine the tiger and the shah b1 parallel each other in so many ways that it can only be concluded that the shah b1 is not the real tiger but it is another tiger but what if this line of thinking itself is flawed? What if it doesn't actually matter how good or bad a tank was when discussing its legacy? Has the legacy of the Tiger One really been decided by historians like us who analyze over the minute details of a story and come up with these nuanced frameworks regarding legacy to contextualize tanks? Or has it been decided by the millions upon millions of fans it has in the popular history community? The people whose love of the Tiger ensure its inclusion in any big ticket war movie? The people whose love of the Tiger guarantees that Tank Fest is booked out every year thanks to Tiger 131. Certainly, their input is as valid as our own, or any scholarly input on the topic. We aren't the ones to gatekeep history here on this channel, but they invariably outweigh us by a significant portion and thus have much more power to dictate what the legacy of a tank actually is in the public zeitgeist.
Now, as we stated at the beginning of this video, our aim today was not to convince you of any particular position on either the Tiger One or the Shah B1. Rather, we wanted to encourage you to have a good think, to think about what actually makes a tank good or bad, what actually constitutes a legendary tank, and then come to your own positions about both of these tanks that we've examined today, as well as the way we think about them. It's important to stress that there is no right or wrong answer here. History is far from an objective science, and all of our opinions are molded by the sources that we've been exposed to and our prejudices and experiences that dictate how we interpret them. But so long as you have a well-considered view backed up by sources and evidence, you have a valid opinion. And you've got every right to shout that view from the rooftops with pride. So then, all that's left to do is to ask you, the audience, well, what do you think? Let us know in the comments below. Was the Shah B1? The real tiger.